Hello, hello, welcome back. If this is your first time here, this is a series where we're trying to make Cubane, or more specifically, Cubane 1,4 dicarboxylic acid. And we're trying to do this from just commonly available materials, or over-the-counter materials, so stuff like from the hardware store. This is the whole reaction scheme, and it's worth pointing out, if you have been here the whole time, it's actually been over a year since we've started this. So that first episode where we turned the, what is it, adipic acid into cyclopentanone. That was over a year ago now, <laughs> so time flies, and we're here at a very important step today, and I'm very excited, and I know a lot of people are very excited about this step, because we get to dip our toes into the deep, murky, uh, slightly frightening ocean that is photochemistry. Wasn't certain we are ever going to make it this far through the synthesis to get to try out this step, but here we are, we get to try out the photochemistry, do the UV step. I think this is one of the most important steps in the synthesis, because it's kind of, for me, I think it's a bit of a bottleneck in the synthesis. It seems seems like the hardest to get right. It's hard to know when you when it's working and when it's not working and also it's it doesn't scale up very well. So it's a bottleneck both on the on the lab scale here like the home lab scale because it's hard to know when you, you're doing it right or not. But it's also a bottleneck on the industrial scale because it's very hard to scale up. If we can manage this step very well, then um, I don't think there'll be any issues for the entire synthesis because the next couple of steps are comparatively um, a lot more straightforward. Well, uh, that's what I think anyway. I'm not going to make any big claims because it could fall down at any point. Okay, so what's actually happening with the chemistry? We've made this molecule, which we call the monoketal, because it's got one ketal group and the other one's a ketone. And we've got two double bonds sort of on the either side of the molecule. What the aim is, is we're going to excite those double bonds with UV light and it will cause a, a sort of a ring closure. So the molecule will sort of uh, the two double bonds will react and it will sort of pinch in on itself. So it's going to form what's called a cage molecule. So I suppose we can call it like the cage ketal. Still got that ketal group on there and we'll have to remove that in the next step. We're forming that cage molecule so we want it to sort of fold in on itself. And that's what's starting to form that cube. So this is the important sort of cube forming step. But yeah, a lot of the synthesis is setting up this molecule so it allows this internal sort of cyclization to happen. It's not, is it a cyclization? I don't know. It's forming that cage. So that, that's what's happening. To do this, we need to excite those double bonds, but only those double bonds. So we don't want to excite anything else because that will lead to side reactions. And we know where the absorption line of those double bonds are from the paper we're following. It's about 300 to 350 nanometers. I talked about this a little bit in the end of the last video, but it's important to note this range because if we're too into the red, so say we do 365 or 395, which are common LED wavelengths, and you can get a lot of power out of there, it's too it's too into the red. We're not going to absorb into those um, double bonds. However, if we go too short a wavelength, so if we say we use an unfiltered mercury lamp and it's putting out sort of 200, 250 nanometers, we're going to absorb into uh, the rest of the molecule, other parts of the molecule, and drive all these side reactions. So we don't want that. So we want a very targeted range. I pitched the idea last video of using a reptile lamp. Now, the advantage of the reptile lamp is that it produces pretty much exactly where we want it to. It's got some, a reasonably high UVB output, which is that sort of 300 to 350 nanometer range. The downside is that it's not very high wattage. So this is still only 25 watts. And um, the comment section, I'd say, was pretty split on whether this was a good idea or not. Some people said they have genuinely tried this in a lab setting and it totally sucked it didn't work some people said they tried this in a lab setting and it actually did work so uh, i'm inclined to just try it we have it um, it's the most over-the-counter sort of uv source mercury lamps start getting a little bit specialist i suppose but if we can achieve it with this sort of over-the-counter reptile lamp that plays into the overall theme of this cubane series where we're just trying to do things from the hardware store and you know the pet store i don't know how well it's going to work I don't know if it's going to work at all, um, but let's, let's try it out and see if we can start forming the dang cage. All right, so we're using UV light, which is a bit of a safety concern. So I was thinking if I can like enclose everything in this plastic box, then we should be able to sort of make it a bit safer because uh, the UV won't be able to escape this plastic very well. Um, so it won't be a danger to be around this when it's on. So what I was thinking is if I could like put this in the wall here, have this hot part like on the outside and then have this blasting into the chamber and have the reaction set up in here. That could work well, I guess, and then we could run it with a lid on or whatever. So I just need to like put a hole here. Fuck it, let's do it, why not? See how we go. 
we need to consider safety. So this is uh, my enclosed space for safety. Every time I pick up a power tool, it always ends in fucking disaster. <laughs> I'm so bad at engineering. Anyway, nothing a bit of tape and a bit of glue can't fix, whatever. You know, the reflector's in there. Let's, uh, let's get the bulb in there. Yeah, all right. So the box might work well as a protective barrier, but uh, I think it won't work well in terms of uh, efficiency because any bit of UV light that doesn't hit our sample in there is gonna hit the sides of these plastic and be absorbed. So we kinda want that to be reflected back in. So even though it's probably gonna make it look horrendous, I kinda wanna <laughs> put a lot of aluminium around here because aluminium has pretty good re reflectivity in the UV. Uh, that's what this reflector is made out as well because um, all that light comes out of the globe in all directions, um, but then it gets pushed forward by this aluminium reflector. Glasses on, and right, sure. Sure, that's a, that's a thing. Okay, so the most ideal, uh, I suppose, flask or container for uh, our material is something very thin. In the paper we're following, they use uh, normal borosilicate glassware um, and that's so that the walls, the Pyrex walls, strip out the real short wavelengths, which they don't want. Um, our lamp doesn't produce any of those short wavelengths, so that's not, not really going to be so much of an issue. So we don't really have to worry about the glass thickness. So this is probably the best bet. It's a test tube, at least I can stopper it properly. Um, that stopper does fit in there. And it's nothing specialised, it's just a test tube really. Um, but uh, yeah, so that would sit, I'm thinking, something like that. Uh, my normal clamp stand doesn't fit in the box, I've just realised, so um, I've just sort of made something up to make it sit nicely. But uh, yeah, that, that sits there, you know, in front of the lamp. We chug it on and uh, let it run. I mean, this is what I've sort of visualised the reactor would look like. So, you know, if it doesn't work, then that's a problem with my uh, thinking not so much with the, the actual equipment. So, um, yeah, shit. So we have our solvent here. This is uh, dichloromethane and methanol. Bit of a mixture. This is what comes straight out of the paint stripper. Um, and so what I would usually do now is I'd wash the dichloromethane to get rid of all the methanol and then redistill. But I'm thinking about doing this a bit fast and loose and just using this as is, um, because we could probably use dichloromethane or methanol for our solvent for this UV reaction. So a mix of it is fine. So we don't need to purify it further than this. A little bit of water at the top, which um, you know isn't great, but uh, it should be reasonably dry enough. It doesn't have to be super dry. I think, once again, fast and loose. We're just gonna just you know take some solvent from the middle. So probably end up using five mils of solvent for about half a gram of solid. That's about the ratio that the, the paper we're following uses. You know, one kilo for 10 liters of solvent. So we're scaling that down quite a bit. But one thing I don't know is I don't know how much the lamp heats up um, the mixture. 
Our solar is pretty precious, so I don't want it boiling off or uh, getting ruined real quickly. So I, I, I want to test how, how much heat um, we're producing because if it gets really hot, we can like turn the lamp on for an hour and then off for an hour and on for an hour. But um, if it doesn't get really hot, then we can just leave it on for all the time and then, you know, it won't take nearly as long. So I might just put five mils of solvent in there without anything else in there and just see how hot it gets. Okay, five mils is not enough in this. <laughs> container and the clamp's in totally the wrong spot so maybe i'll put that up to 10 mils and we'll just do half the concentration um, because we're illuminating a, a large area then maybe a lower concentration will help anyway potentially so we'll put 10 mils in why not we've got solvent to burn for a change not the best of setups but it is floating in there in front of the lamp so let's chuck it on why not sure uh, we'll come back in a little bit and see <laughs> if the temperature's warmed up or uh, we've lost all solvent. Actually, we might draw where that solvent line is. So then um, if, uh, if we lose any solvent, then at least we know we lose some solvent. So, all right, 30 minutes later, let's have a look. I mean, there's a bit of heat coming off the lamp. I can feel that. Solvent level hasn't dropped. All right, keep it going. We'll keep it going. We need to run it for longer than half an hour for the real reaction, so. Also, people will probably comment, hey, just use sunlight, but um, I hate to inform you, but it does actually rain here sometimes too, and it's not always sunny, because it's the middle of winter here currently. Fuck, it's rained a whole week. Um, next week it'll be sunny, and it was sunny the week before, but um, you know, this is rainy week. Once a year, we have uh, a couple of days of rain, and then that's it. It's uh, blaring sunlight for the rest of it, but um, I fucking have uh, picked rainy week to be, um, you know, one week I'm trying to do a UV reaction. Yeah, the sun is somewhere in the sky. I don't even own an umbrella. There's the sun. There he is. What are you doing? Just gone over 90 minutes uh, continuously. Right, turn him off. Slightly warmer in here. Not really. Um, you can feel the radiant heat coming off that bowl, but... Once again, this sort of shielding isn't hot. None of this is hot. This is no real warmer than the outside temperature. Solvent level's pretty good, so the stopper seems to be keeping it in. It doesn't really look like the right size stopper, but this is the stopper I got sent with it. Whoever sent me this, thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've greased this stopper as well, so. All right, well, there's literally nothing to complain about for now. We can definitely do 90 minutes, two hours at a time, probably longer. Uh, without worrying about uh, heating up and solvent loss and all that. So um, this is good. Yeah, good. I don't have to bloody do any, like, control stuff. <laughs> I just plug it in and let it run. Perfect. That's what I want. All right, let's do it. We have our mono key towel. This is one gram. We'll use half of it. We'll use half a gram. Weigh it out. Put it into our solvent. Here we already have our 10 mils of uh, mostly DCM, a little bit of methanol. Hopefully it all dissolves in the solvent. That's an important step. But uh, let's get it happening. Why not? Right, that dissolved to form a, uh, I would say, perfectly clear solution. We've got one or two floaty bits in there. Just always seem to creep in because I, I'm doing things in a shed. <laughs> so uh, it's time to start the clock, I guess. Sure. Goodbye. Good luck. We'll see it again in, oh, I suppose, an hour or so. All right, it's been an hour. It's been an hour. I mean, a whole dang hour. Let's have a look. I mean, nothing has changed. What am I expecting after an hour? I don't know. I'm going to have to, like, monitor this with, like, TLC, aren't I? Nothing magical has happened after one hour. So, that's fine. Um, I'm going to have to think about TLC for it. Hey, whatever. Cool. It's fine. It's going. It's working. Maybe. Who knows? Goodbye. Oi. Why, oh, you flaming galahs? Get off the lawn. Stop eating the lawn. 
God, look how they ruin the grass. They're like eating the roots and shit. They dig it up. Yeah, I see ya. I'm gonna get ya. Oh yeah. Just hit two and a half hours. What am I expecting to see? Oh, it's a little warmer in here. Yeah, it's just the same. I <laughs> haven't worked out how to do the TLC yet. And by worked out, I mean, I know what I'm doing. I just haven't got around to it. Hopefully after two and a half hours, we start to see the formation of something else, even if it's a small amount. Hey, it didn't blow up. My, my, my expectations for this are very low. So the fact that it didn't blow up means that um, it's already exceeding expectations. <laughs> All right, it is very late at night. I still haven't done the TLC, but hey, good news. Uh, I ran this for another two hours. <laughs> it's fine. All right, all right, we'll approach it. The ice is slightly off. That's fine. Oh, now I can't see shit. Uh, I didn't think this through. Hold on. Hold on, where's the switch? Uh, interesting observation. So we're at the four and a half hour mark under the lamp, and uh, it's no longer a perfectly clear solution. It's a little subtle, but you know, it was perfectly clear when we first put it in, and now it is a slight brown color. Of course, that's probably just due to tar. All right, so here we are at the TLC station. I'm not that excited to do TLC. Uh, it takes up a lot of time, but uh, it's, it's the best way of monitoring um, if this reaction is actually doing anything. We've got a few things to do. We've got to remake the permanganate stain. I've left the last stain out just in the light and in the air, and it's been like a month, so it looks like crap. People have said that they didn't really like the look of that stain anyway. So I will be making the stain to an exact recipe that someone posted in the comments. I think a few different people posted this exact formulation in the comments. So I'm inclined to believe it. So we'll do that. And if I keep it out of the light and with a lid on, it might last for more than a week. So we'll do that. We're gonna make more spotters out of these uh, uh, glass capillary tubes. I'm just gonna be using this DCM methanol uh, mixture as an elucent. Hopefully it works. It's like incredibly fast and loose because like it's still wet. I really should do a DCM distillation out of this, but um, I just can't be bothered. So I haven't got around to it yet. We're not gonna be using any of this hexane fraction that I sort of half-heartedly made last video. I mean, it's mostly evaporated anyway now. It's crap. But we've got, you know, a, a sample here at the two and a half hour mark under the lamp and the four and a half hour mark under the lamp and also the starting material. So we'll run those three lanes and see if, if any new spots develop over those uh, those three lanes um, at the two and a half and four and a half hour mark. You know, hopefully if there are new spots, they, they you know, separate in uh, random allutant solvent. Allutant solvent? Allutant. Yes. Okay, the good news is uh, the stain looked like it worked really well. Uh, that worked better, so thanks for the recipe. The bad news is it doesn't look like we got very much separation. Either that or we've just formed no product, but that uh, I don't think that's the case. It's probably because our, our allutant solvent, allutant solvent, allutant is just too polar. So it's <laughs> just too much methanol and too much water in this solvent. Yeah, shit. Um, I'm going to have to bloody distill the DCM out of this and get pure DCM.
Okay, so removing the methanol uh, from the DCM did uh, did lower the dots. Um, you know, that's where they were when we had the methanol in there, and now you can see they've moved down. I mean, slightly. I don't want to say distilling the DCM was a waste of time, but it was a waste of time. Anyway, so this was the starting material after four hours and after 12 hours, and we're not really seeing much else apart from these <laughs> dots here. So I'm starting to come around uh, to thinking that maybe we've barely done anything to our starting material after 12 hours. You know, maybe it's not separating from here. Maybe, maybe, but I, I, I think it should. Yeah, we're just gonna run it under the lamp for some several more hours, quite a few more hours. Now just see if we can do anything here. I really did think 12 hours we should at least start seeing the start of something, but um, not seeing anything after 12 hours really um, doesn't doesn't make this look good, I'll be honest. It has been 22 hours under the lamp. Wow, it is really raining outside. <laughs> um, it's pretty brown these days. Yeah, we've got to run the TLC, see, what, see what's happening, see if anything at all shows up after 22 hours. <laughs> I'm not going to bother filming it, I'm, I'm sick of filming TLCs. Oh, is that some sunlight? Ooh. It has been flooding. All right, anyway. Could it be an extremely faint dot appearing? So on this plate, all three lanes are the 21 hour mark. Uh, they're just at different concentrations. So this first column has developed the, the best. And look here, look, it's a very faint dot. You know, it's not great. The reason I'm going on and on about this is TLC is quite sensitive. So we should be seeing a new product as a separate distinct dot below 10%, really. I, I would imagine if we had 10% of a different product, it should show up on TLC. It, it, it should really show up even much below that, you know. Um, on the other hand, potentially, um, maybe the stain doesn't really work on this because maybe the stain works really well here because we've got two double bonds in the structure, it's unsaturated, whereas our product here is saturated. So maybe the permanganate stain doesn't uh, change color quite as nicely for it. I'm not sure, but um, I mean, I suppose this is good news. This is the first time we're seeing evidence of a, a distinct product Here we go, here's the plate after 24 hours of lamp time and that's spread across two weeks, which is less than optimal, but I, I like to be here when it's running. Um, so uh, yeah, it's only really when I'm in the lab am I running the lamp, so, so that's why that 24 hours is spread across two weeks. All three lanes once again are from um, the 24 hour. And look, we have more dots, more than one, but uh, more than two now. Um, I've had this bottom line here in, in a lot of plates. You can see it's very faintly here. Um, and I've sort of always discounted it because it sort of came through as a line uh, rather than like individual dots and individual lanes. But um, it sort of looks like it's resolving into dots now. It may be a, once again, uh, an artifact that the stain, the permanganate stain doesn't really pick up um, these sort of saturated products very well without the double bonds. A few of you would be screaming at me right now saying why the fuck hasn't he got a fluorescent lamp and having a look at them under UV. I'm a bit of an idiot and I thought these weren't fluorescently backed um, so I never got a torch for it but I went back and looked and they are fluorescently backed and I thought they weren't fluorescently backed because I used my UV torch and saw that uh, it didn't light up at all, but this is a 395 nanometer UV torch and turns out you need 254 nanometer light so um, this torch won't show up the fluorescent compound in the plate. So yes, um, we need to get that lamp, but it's getting shipped from overseas and that's very slow, so that will take weeks. Look, we only want one other product, so it looks like we've got two other products coming through which isn't great, um, I've no idea what they are, you know, this could be product and tar, this could be tar and tar, who knows. <laughs> Alright, so we've run it for 24 hours, it's pretty tarry, you can see how discoloured it is now, you know, that was perfectly clear going in and now it's definitely gone yellow. Fucking of course it has, look I could keep running this under the lamp for more hours, I don't know if I'm wasting my time doing this, so I'm going to, I won't say cheat, rely on some, once again, some very generous help. Someone else has offered to run an NMR for me. So I will dry this out, I'll remove the solvent, uh, take the raw reaction mix here, send it off for analysis, and that analysis will be able to tell me if 
any of the product is formed, and in what ratios. Last time we sent material off for analysis, and the analysis came back with very good news. So maybe, maybe that will happen again. Um, no promises. We have evidence, very faint evidence, that we might be forming our product. And that's the best I can give you, I think, at this stage. So we're going to pretend that we have product fucking at least... 10 micrograms of product. If our analysis comes back and we're saying, oh, maybe there's 2% of product there, if it's taken us 24 hours of lamp time to get to 2%, I'm not really going to run it for, for hundreds of hours. If it comes back and say maybe it's 30 to 40%, unlikely, but it might, we could run it for three days. Potentially I could get a second one of these identical lamps and put it on the other side of the box. I have a feeling a lot of comments will tell me just get a dang mercury lamp, but it's not that easy. Where do I even buy a, a mercury lamp from? I've got to pay for it and you know, money doesn't grow on trees here in Australia, it's plastic. How I even run it, I think this is only rated for 150 watts and some mercury lamps aren't self ballasted so I need a ballast and I don't know what the fuck that even is I hope to use this lamp but uh, if it's going to take hundreds of hours that's too long <laughs> this is too long so please any ideas in the comments for what we can do to speed this up and actually make it work assuming that we've got a couple of percent of products and this lamp does work but it's just extremely slow what can we do throw this lamp in the bin and get a completely new one. Do I get eight lamps? <laughs> That's a lot of money. Uh, and just focus it all in there. That will probably get very hot. Looking forward to your thoughts, but thanks for watching. Um, I'll see you next time, hopefully with the analysis results. And um, for now we can be in denial and say that everything is all good.